Well, good morning. It is blessed to be back with you, Christ Community Church. Thank you so much for allowing me the grace and opportunity to uh, worship with you all and prayerfully encourage your hearts through uh, the proclamation of God's word. This morning, I'd love to invite you to join me in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. The title of our time together in this sermon today is Kingdom Living in 2021. Uh, 2020 was very tough, very hard, arguably uh, one of the most challenging years uh, that I know I've ever faced in my life, and many others have said that. I know a lot of people, at least online, were expressing they were done with 2020 back in March. Well, uh, it took nine more months for us to officially be done with 2020, but here we stand, and God's good grace blessed those of us who are in Jesus Christ. The reality, though, of 2020 is something that I want us to, to reflect on and think through as it prayerfully can give us energy to look at God's word and how we are called to live as citizens in the kingdom of God in 2021. I can't lie, I'm gonna be very transparent and honest with you all. The reason 2020 was very challenging and tough and stretching and even exposing in my own heart, in my own life, is that towards the very latter part of the year, uh, my family and I began to endure just trial after trial after trial after trial. We're still coming out of a season of grief and trying to understand uh, why we're not getting the answer to the question, why? On November the 2nd, my mother and father-in-law were rushed to the ICU in Kansas City. My mother-in-law never returned home. She went to glory December the 8th. Just two weeks ago, yesterday, on Saturday, I had the privilege of doing my mother-in-law's funeral. It's the most hardest sermon I've ever had to write and deliver. But at the same time, as if that was not enough, dealing with both my in-laws in ICU, not knowing if either one of them is going to make it, yet at the same time, losing one of them and having this overwhelming sense of grief, my own father, in his three-year battle with cancer, every three months has to go under the knife to have cancer cut out of various major organs in his body. And this is going to happen until the Lord calls him home. In the last few days of December, I got a phone call from my mother in which she said the biopsy showed that she has lung cancer. Never smoked a cigarette in her life. Don't understand what's going on. She has a fully, completely diseased liver. And now with this new cancer being seen and confirmed that it's malignant, now she can't get a liver transplant. So it's just all these tensions, all these weighty issues that we're dealing with in, in our own little personal family compared with all the other people in our country who are Christ followers that are dealing with the loss of job, loss of income, divorce, loss of a child, loss of a spouse, loss of a sibling and a parent. And 2020 was very hard on so many of us. We're also coming out of the season of Advent, and Advent is when we look at the first coming of Jesus Christ and how he invaded our world. Being fully God, he clothed himself in full humanity. He lived the perfect life you and I will never live. He died in the place of sinners on a cross. He was buried, and three days later, he rose from the grave, showing that the payment that he paid with his shed blood as a pure, unblemished sacrifice, was accepted by God. And now those who embrace Christ can have their sins and their debts forgiven and removed and the righteousness of Jesus given to them as a free gift of salvation. Jesus then ascended to the Father, and we have been waiting for his glorious, triumphant return, his second coming. And so we live in the tension between his first and second advents. Inside of this tension is pain, confusion, grief, mourning, mixed with moments of joy and happiness and pleasures. The reality of being a Jesus follower does not make us exempt from suffering with the rest of the world, even with our neighbors. If anything, it gives us a platform to show that we too are human, that we too are flawed, that we are imper imperfect, but we're striving to have the grace, compassion of a perfect savior modeled through the way that we live, talk, and move throughout our life rhythms. You and I both know that December 31st, 
11.59 p.m., all the weightiness of 2020 that each of us encountered individually did not vanish at midnight January 1st, 2021. It didn't. There are consequences from last year that roll over automatically to the next year, to the next day. And that's why I feel that this text today will help us align a a biblical way forward for us to live even in the midst of the angst and the tensions that 2020 and every year in our lives before 2020 compounded as we move into 2021. There's hope, and that hope is found through Christ alone. The reality of our main point for the passage today is this. The Beatitudes are a snapshot of kingdom life for citizens in God's kingdom. The Beatitudes are a snapshot of kingdom life for citizens in God's kingdom. There's two main questions, which are my two main points, that I want us to walk through to find the answers to. The first question is our first point. What does it mean to be blessed? We see this word reoccurring all throughout the Beatitudes. Blessed is the one. Blessed, 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 blessed. So we have to understand, what does it mean to be blessed? Well, the Word of God tells us in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. Now, what's going on in this passage is that people are following Jesus. They're attracted to the way he teaches. They're attracted to the way that he is healing and casting out demons. He is actually projecting and proclaiming God as Father, something that Israel was not used to hearing. Jesus took this moment of all the masses of people that were following him to sit down and instruct them and correct them on who God is and what benefits that does for the person who is in a right relationship with God. Similar to the way that, now I'm going to have to challenge y'all, if you can think back to a long time ago when we used to go into, into these rooms called movie theaters. And when we would enter into the movie theaters, after spending about a quarter of a million dollars on two tickets and a tub of popcorn and a soda, we would sit down, we would talk, be on our phones, putting up selfies or what have you. And then all of a sudden, when the lights dim, we all know that our focus is to now include removing every distraction from the reason that we are there. So the lights dim and we take that cultural cue to know that I have to remove every distraction so that I can focus on what the feature is. In a similar way, this is exactly what the crowds knew, that when Jesus sat, that was like us knowing what to do when the lights dim in a movie theater. They knew the teacher was about to speak. He's about to drop some knowledge. He's about to help us understand the ways of God. And so Jesus opens up his instruction by using the word blessed. Now, I've heard the word blessed reduced down to just simplified happy. Be happy. Happy is the person who dot, dot, dot. But I don't think that that translation does justice to the depth of what this word blessed means. To kind of give an illustration, I want to turn to food because I think we all like food in this place. And so the reality of food helps me understand that someone who is saying that this word blessed means happy, they're missing so much. It reminds me of a time that when my wife and I were living in Atlanta, Georgia, and I took her out for a date, our first one in Lord knows how long, and we sat down at this nice restaurant. We ordered the chicken and vegetable dinner platter, and we were talking and dialoguing. Within 10 minutes, our waiter came back with two plates and sat them down in front of us. Now, these plates were very large, and the portion was very, very small. It was like one little sliver of grilled chicken, and three baby carrots with some sauce drizzled all over it. And I'm sitting there, and I was like, oh, waiter, I'm sorry, we didn't order any appetizers. I'm thinking this is like, you know, something from the kids' menu that they may have wanted to send to the table around the way because this is not a chicken dinner platter. This is not. Now, the, the plate looks like a platter, but this is no chicken dinner on that platter. And so the waiter said, no, that is the chicken dinner platter. And I said, you gotta be kidding me. Are you serious? 
I'm like, I'm paying half month rent for baby carrots and Thousand Island with one little sliver of grilled chicken on each of our plates. Are you serious? And the waiter said, you know, I don't even eat here, though I work here. And I'm like, well, that's not going to help the Yelp review, bro. You know, and so I'm sitting here like, man. So I go to my wife and I said, let's just go to McDonald's and get double quarter pounders. You know, we're better off doing that, saving money. Then we can, you know, put a down payment on a movie ticket or something like that. And so as, I, as I'm sitting there thinking, I'm like, man, okay, all this plate, little food. Now, let's compare that to what my plate looked like on Thanksgiving. My plate at Thanksgiving at our house this past November had turkey with homemade turkey gravy from my wife, whipped mashed potatoes, freshly peeled, boiled the whole nine, enchiladas, enchilada casserole. There's a difference. We also had tamales. We also had cornbread. We had 300,000 types of dinner rolls because our kids love bread. We had cream peas, which is my personal staple, stuffing, the whole nine. Like the reality of my plate is that it was overflowing with food. Gravy was dripping on the side. Cream from the, the pea sauce was dripping over on the side. It was a plethora of food. There was more food food in abundance than the plate could hold. So you have one where there's more plate, a little bit of food, and then there's a plate, but then the food is overflowing. When people say blessed means happy, that's that little baby carrot plate. When we understand the robust meaning of what it means to be blessed, it is overflowing with joy because one understands they have a right relationship with God and that right relationship with God through Jesus comes with benefits that don't stop. God keeps pouring the benefits out to us. And so to be blessed, according to Psalm chapter one, verse one, is that it says, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the company of mockers. Psalm 32 verses 1 and 2 tells us, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, in whose spirit there is no deceit. The fulfillment of blessedness is seen in the life of Christ. Specifically thinking about Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1, 2, and 3, which it says this, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from the darkness for prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, which was the year of jubilee. In addition, the day of vengeance of our God, which represented divine righteous judgment, to comfort all who mourn and provide those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Jesus embodied that definition of blessed. And when we embrace Jesus, his embodiment of that blessed now showers us and covers us nonstop. Every breath we breathe on this side of eternity while living in Christ, we are blessed. Even when we fail, even when our humanity takes control of our words, our attitudes, our tone, our nonverbal expressions, even when we fall into sin as Jesus followers, we are still blessed. Your move and my move when we are in Christ cannot remove the state of being blessed. Our problem is we block living in it because it doesn't fit our preference, specifically in the moments when we feel that we need to be justified, when we deserve this, whatever it may be. And so as I look at this, I take comfort in the fact that Jesus lived the perfect life I never could. So what that truth helps me understand is that I don't have to eat from the bowl of false guilt anymore. 
I don't have to think that, that God is reduced to now wanting to take his vengeance out on me because I didn't read my Bible for three days, because I didn't pray six times a day, because I haven't shared the gospel in this 24-hour period. This is a false view of God that takes the ideas of legalism and we put it on us like prison clothes and then we reduce this compassionate, righteous, faithful, and just God to an idol that we can control. And the reality of living blessed means I have to undo my skewed view of God and I have to go back to the word of God and I have to look at what Jesus did because when I embrace Jesus, his righteousness, his life movements, his perfection now covers me. And when the father sees me, he sees the perfection of Jesus. Even though I see the imperfections of Damon, when I'm looking in the mirror right back at myself. We have to begin to view ourselves through what the word of God says God views us as. Not the way that we interpret ourselves. So as it relates to blessed in Jesus. Jesus did not walk in step or in cahoots with the wicked. He never sinned. He lived spirit filled every moment. He is the only one who can bring full justice. And according to the book of Revelation, he is the one that will do that when he returns. The reality of judgment in scripture shows us that God administers absolute justice in the sense that he rights every wrong. That's what justice is. When something is wrong, it is made right. And the person who was done wrong, they are given restoration so that they can now move forward in healing. Jesus offers that. Jesus announced the good news that salvation is only found in him. Jesus also was the one who heals broken hearts. He provides holistic freedom for each and every one of us, and he clothes every single person who embraces him in his righteousness, and he gives us garments of praise, not chains of despair. We're coming out of a very difficult 2020, a global pandemic that nine months ago, none of us thought that would lead to social distancing in January 2021, mask wearing, hand sanitizing, a contested presidential election that we're still not out of the woods in. It's going to be a very interesting next couple of days. <laughs> Escalated racial tensions unseen since the 60s. Violence in our cities. Murder rates. Records being broken in countless cities across the United States. The deaths of family and friends, the closing of businesses that people sank their last penny of their retirement into. Stimulus checks that make us more irritated than comforted. There's so many tensions and so many issues and brokenness that did not disappear at midnight when we said Happy New Year. But the reality of it is 2020 had an expiration date. 2020 met its expiration date. 2020 is not our enemy. The reality of it is, is that the global church of Jesus Christ has a three millennia track record of enduring with many 2020s. And the reality of what we see in 2021 as kingdom citizens is that the kingdom of God has never been shaken by a global pandemic. The kingdom of God has never been shaken or thwarted by any war in human history, even both world wars. The mission that Jesus has called his church to live on in this broken, war-filled, hostile world has never retreated and it's never changed since he delivered it on that mountain in Galilee by telling his people to make disciples of every ethnicity on planet Earth. That's never changed. And Jesus today is reminding us of our marching orders as we enter into this new year. The condition for being blessed, receiving the jubilee that Jesus offers, understanding that our sins have been judged when they were put on Jesus instead of us, 
leads us to joy, that we can be connected to our Savior who connects us to God every moment of every day, no matter what is thrown our way. So the condition for me and you living as those who are blessed is simply embracing Jesus. That's what it means to be blessed. So my second question, which is my second point is, okay, that sounds great. Very abstract, very theoretical. But dude, what does this look like on the day-to-day? I'm glad you asked. Because the second question is, what does it look like to live blessed? So Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Let me help you understand what that phrase poor in spirit means. It literally means to declare spiritual bankruptcy. In the United States of America, one can declare bankruptcy, and if you can qualify for a chapter 7, like my wife and I did way back, eons and eons ago, during something known as the Great Recession that you youngsters are learning on virtual education right now, there was this thing called the Great Recession a few years ago, and many of us lost our homes. And the reality of our situation is my wife was laid off. And she could not find work for 18 months. Our savings depleted with, hmm, we had a comma in the number in our savings, and and there were five digits. And it was depleted in 18 months all the way down to $200. We didn't have money to pay our bills. We were young, inexperienced, and we grew up in poverty. So we began to pay our bills on credit cards. That's a no-no, young people. The reality was we racked up a debt that we could not pay. Mathematically, it was impossible. So we went to a lawyer, to an advocate. We showed them our financial situations, showed them all of our debts, what our income to ratio with our debt looked like. And they said, you qualify for a Chapter 7, which means you can walk away with everything. You don't have to pay your creditors. But it's going to bring you back to zero. It's going to destroy your credit. You're going to have to pay everything cash. But you're going to have to learn new life rhythms to not repeat this again. And we did. And the reality of declaring bankruptcy is saying, I have racked up a debt that it is impossible for me to ever pay. And I can't give enough to satisfy my creditors who I owe debt to. So the courts legally discharge your debt. It is forgiven. But then the courts leave you with a sum of zero, and they say, be warm and filled, and we don't want to see you in the next seven to eight years again. Now, spiritual bankruptcy is similar, but it's different. There's more benefits. Spiritual bankruptcy recognizes I'm a sinner. And when I look at the word of God, sin comes with a penalty and price. The penalty is death. The price is pure blood shed from an unblemished sacrifice. Well, because I'm a sinner, I'm never going to be unblemished. So anything that I do that I think is going to be merit or currency or a down payment or an installment to pay against my sin debt, it's always going to be blemished because I'm blemished with sin. Church attendance, going to the mosque, religious affiliation, charitable deeds, December contributions to nonprofits for tax write-offs. None of those things wash away your sins. That's not acceptable currency to God the Father. There's only one acceptable form of currency in order for that spiritual bankruptcy to become a reality. And that is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So declaring spiritual bankruptcy says, I racked up the debt. Jesus didn't. He didn't know any sin, but I sinned against God, and I cannot do anything to pay off my debt. So in my declaration of spiritual bankruptcy, I take ownership for all of my sin that I've committed, and I go to the cross of Jesus, and I say, this is my debt. Please, in your mercy, apply your blood. So that my sins can be forgiven. My debt can be washed away. And spiritual bankruptcy promises that when we embrace Christ, his payment is applied to our account. But here's the good news that's even better. Is that it doesn't just bring us to a now sum of zero. But what Jesus does 
According to Romans chapter 4 and Romans chapter 5, now he cash apps, he Venmos, he direct deposits to our account an infinite credit of his righteousness. So it's not that our sins have just been washed away and forgiven like what we see in Ephesians 1, 7, but rather an infinite credit of Jesus' perfect life has been given to our account. So when God sees us, he sees Jesus' perfect life that covers us. An infinite amount of righteousness given to us as a gift. We didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. But God in his mercy, when we cried out, I declare bankruptcy, not like Michael Scott on the office, but we legit say, I am a guilty sinner. I can't save myself. Jesus is the only qualified one who can save me. Save me. That is declaring spiritual bankruptcy. And what Jesus says about the poor in spirit who have declared spiritual bankruptcy, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, which means kingdom citizenship throughout all of eternity has been given to us who have embraced Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. You cannot be blessed in the sense that Christ embodied and offers if you do not embrace Jesus. Secondly, as we're dealing with this reality of embracing Jesus, he says, blessed are those who mourn. To mourn means to grieve with deep sadness. This word is often used to describe the mourning and the lamenting and the grieving at a funeral. As I said two weeks ago, I never thought that I would be there to preach at my mother-in-law's funeral. It's still surreal to me. I, I still am struggling to process things. The mourning and the lamenting that went on, not just in that moment, but the days prior and the days after, even through last night as I was dialoguing with my wife, there was a deep grief, weeping, shedding of tears. We are emotionally weighed down. As strong as this word is in the Greek, it's the strongest of the nine words in the Greek language to express sorrow. It's not talking about the sorrow of a loss of a loved one. It's actually talking about the mourning, the grieving, when we take ownership for our sinfulness that leads us to declare the spiritual bankruptcy. On March 31st, 1996, that's the day that I mourned. That's the day that I embraced Jesus. I heard the gospel preached numerous times. I even preached the gospel and I wasn't even saved. But that night, as my mama made me sit in the front row, like she always did at church, I heard the gospel. And for the first time, God opened my heart to my sinfulness. And I remember falling to my knees as a Almost 16-year-old, prideful as all get out, worried about what people thought about him in a church of 3,000 people in the inner city. I was right there in the front row in the evening, and I was broken, crying uncontrollably. I didn't care who saw me. I wasn't even thinking about that. I realized the weightiness of my sin. And as they begin to sing, pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. I crawled to the altar and asked Jesus to save me. I declared spiritual bankruptcy because the weightiness of my mourning over my sin was something that I recognized was necessary. What's amazing about why we would be considered blessed while we're mourning, that seems oxymoronic, seems contradictory. But the reality of it is, Jesus promises those who mourn over their sin, you will be comforted. Comforted by the arms of the embrace of your Savior. Comforted by having peace with God. Comforted by having the Holy Spirit live inside of you. And comforted by now living as a Jesus follower in community with other people who have declared spiritual bankruptcy and who have mourned over their sin. 
See, there's a connection to the family in Christ. That's why Jesus then moves to the meek. Blessed are the meek. The meek are those who practice self-control that empowers you to be gentle with people who are declaring spiritual bankruptcy and mourning over their sin. You don't sit there and take the rod of judgment. You don't sit there and give prejudiceness to them. You don't sit there and shame them. You engage by getting in the tension of the mourning and saying, I know what you're going through. I was there. And as God comforted me, I'm with you to comfort you. That's being meek. It's all connected interpersonally with us. Social distancing, a global pandemic, it doesn't stop the reality of how we are called to live with one another. It just gives us creative opportunities in how we embody this. To the meek, Jesus says, you will inherit the earth, which means you don't just have kingdom citizenship. You're given ownership rights in God's kingdom. As an American citizen, it's a blessing to be an American citizen, but I ain't got ownership over nothing in America, honestly. If anything, with my social security number, I owe because of the national debt. (laughs) I mean, that's like, oh, man, I got citizenship, but y'all say I owe $75,000. I'm still in school. I can't pay for nothing. You know, so like I'm still wrestling with all that, but in the kingdom of God, it's like when you embrace Jesus, you're a co-heir. You, you are brought into having ownership. See, that's the difference. When we understand what blessed living looks like, we no longer treat the local church with a consumeristic perspective where it's actually good for the church that I show up. Or, man, the church needs my giftedness. That's a consumer mentality. Because if you enter into the church with a consumer mentality, then you become center. And the leadership, the word of God, and the other people become periphery. And if your preferences are not met, guess what? You shop around. You go somewhere else. That's a phenomenon here. That's not going on in the Sudan, where brothers and sisters are being persecuted for their faith, where they have to meet in caves, or they have to have a picnic in the park in order to have worship gatherings together. That's not because of the global pandemic. That's because of the hatred of Jesus Christ. But in America, oh, man, I got 40 different options. I can go wherever I want. We lose the connectivity of kingdom living because we put preferences on the pedestal instead of Jesus Christ. So the reality of what it means is let's remove the consumeristic tendencies and let's challenge our brothers and sisters in our local church. Remove consumerism because when you're a consumer, you're not thinking like an owner. When you're an owner, you have skin in the game. You have investment. You have a desire for longevity and endurance no matter what comes. Kingdom living in 2021 must do away with consumerism because we, who are the meek in Christ, have ownership in the kingdom of God. So let's think like owners. Let's cooperate together like owners so that the world will see kingdom living made visible before their eyes. This leads us, as Jesus says, the blessed hunger and thirst for righteousness. This means that we are to constantly have a desire to pursue justice, equity, and moral purity. This phrase, hunger and thirst, is written in what we call the present tense, which means it should be something that is ongoing, similar to our appetite. We wake up, sometimes we're hungry, sometimes we're not. When we get hungry, eventually we eat. But that one meal in that time or that snack does not satisfy us for the rest of our lives. But we've bought into this lie, man, there was a time in my life when I hungered and thirst for righteousness. Right now, man, I'm just trying to, you know, put in my last few years, get into retirement, or I'm just trying to get through senioritis for this last semester, or you know what, I'm just trying to get through this internship so I can get to my career. And we just like think everything is compartmentalized. And if if we haven't hungered and thirsted for righteousness in a decade, something's wrong with us. Something's not wrong with God. Because this is to be ongoing. And so what I have to look at my heart in my time in prayer is say, God, you already know I ain't got no hunger and thirst for righteousness. That means I'm filling my life with things that are temporarily satisfying me, that is keeping my hunger for righteousness and justice and equity sufficed. So I need to identify what are the things in my life that I am hungering and thirsting for that are competing 
with righteousness. The desire to see that. Jesus says those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be satisfied. You know what's amazing? The satisfaction, that verb, is written in what we call the passive tense, which means you and I must receive satisfaction. All of our efforts, everything that we're investing in, it will never satisfy us. Satisfaction will only come from God. So we have to posture ourselves to recognize the government, whoever is in office, whatever decisions are being made in any space of influence that we are in, satisfaction cannot come from any of those people. We have to lower our expectations for other human beings. And then we have to recalibrate our heart towards heaven to say, you're the only one that's going to satisfy. You're the only one that's going to embody justice. You're the only one that's going to produce equity. You're the only one that will shape hearts to have a desire for moral purity. Jesus says to be blessed means to be merciful, to share compassion liberally and forgive others freely when they have harmed us. As I close in the next few minutes, I want to touch on something briefly here. There's no specific stipulation that Jesus puts on us showing mercy. It's to be given all the time. But often, as American church history has shown, that has been used as a tactic of abuse and suppression when crimes have been committed in churches by leadership and by other members. We are now living in a very scandalized era in the United States of America when it comes to the, the local church. Issues of sexual abuse, issues of racism, issues of discrimination, things that have been covered up that are now surfacing all throughout different ministries and it's been happening repeatedly over and over and over again. In Europe, often the church is not mentioned even in pi public conversation or private conversation unless there's a scandal involved and progressively that's what it looks like here in America. So I do want to speak to something. We have to recognize that when we extend forgiveness and when we give mercy to somebody who has offended us, if there was a crime committed against us, it is not a sign of unforgiveness to pursue justice when a crime has been committed. Many sexual abuse survivors have been shamed out of churches because they were told if you call out the pastor or the leader, if you don't sign this non-disclosure agreement, if you don't do these things, then you're not walking in forgiveness. You are offering bitterness in your heart. You will be brought under church discipline or you will be excommunicated or you will be informally shunned by the community. And there are hearts that are so hurt that that hurt mutated into bitterness and all they do is spew hatred towards Christ's body now because of how they were treated. And God is not pleased with that. As a husband of a wife who is a sexual abuse survivor, these are conversations that we have. When a sin has been committed against you, you can extend forgiveness. But we have to understand that consequences don't go away just because forgiveness has been administered. And if there was a crime committed, it's not a sin to pursue justice if the state laws and statutes provide you the space to do so. That is why we must be supportive of our brothers and sisters because often justice in those situations is the entryway to healing, dealing with their trauma and the layers and layers of everything that they have just been compounding and holding in. Victims of abuse deserve holistic healing. That's part of the healing process. When we show mercy, God says that we will be shown mercy by him. That also leads to us being pure in heart, that we would have a desire to live pure in accordance to the word of God. And those are blessed who are pure in heart because Jesus promises we will see God, meaning that we will have an intimate connection with God even in the times when we feel that he's not answering the question why. Even in the midst of the darkness of financial crisis, stresses in our marriage and in our relationships with our children, maybe our parents or siblings, like all these tensions, we think, God, where are you? He's never left us. And sometimes it's in the silence 
that God uses that silence to build our faith and trust in him so that we won't look to him as a sugar daddy, a get out of jail free card to make everything right all the time. The Bible does not promise Jesus' followers exemption from suffering. We are not exempt from even having crimes committed against us or being victimized with burglaries and things. that We live in a fallen, broken world. And just because we encounter hardships, we must fight against our flesh and the interpretation of the world to think that God does not exist because we're suffering or that God has forgotten us or maybe he's punishing us for some secret sin in our life that somehow we can never find. God is not a sadistic, vindictive, fallen human being. He is absolutely righteous, perfect, compassionate, merciful, and just. All of his attributes are in perfect balance every moment of every day. He is not like us. His ways are not like our ways. His thoughts are not like our thoughts. Often, I, I understand this more when I speak to my kids, and, and I can't give them the full understanding of something because they haven't lived enough to understand what's really going on. So I give them what they can understand. Sometimes I just have to tell them, you'll understand when you get older. And then I revisit my daughter who's 16. Remember when I told you, you'll understand when you're older, let me help you understand. Now that you've lived through some things, boom, boom, boom. She's like, oh my gosh, I get it now. I'm like, yeah, when I would have told you at six, you wouldn't have understood any of that. Very similar with God. Sometimes it's like, man, why, why, why? And God's like, you just won't understand right now. Keep on living. Keep on trusting. That's why Jesus says, follow me in the indicative present, which means it's a command, but it means keep on following. But what, I, what if I fail? What if I don't live as a peacemaker like what Jesus says, one who steps into the tension of division and brings harmony? That's what we need to be doing in 2021. Man, there's so much fraction and division, especially online amongst Christians, politically, socially, economically, theologically, you name it. Everybody's got a subcamp of a subcamp of a subcamp. We unfriend, we block, we mute, we troll, like all these things constantly weighing on us. Friendly fire, ammunition, being wasted, Christian to Christian, using the Bible as weaponry to prove somebody's conspiracy theory wrong or right. That's where we are. And Jesus says, as blessed ones in 2021, step into the divisiveness and seek to bring peace. But I'm going to be honest with you. Even when Paul says in Romans chapter 12, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone, brothers and sisters, even in the family of Christ, not everybody wants peace, unfortunately. So you have to learn to put up healthy boundaries. Offer peace if people don't want it. Walk away in peace. To you, you'll be called the children of God. As the worship team comes up, the last point that Jesus said is that you're blessed when you're persecuted because of righteousness. Those who are righteous and seek to live out the kingdom ethics that Jesus is giving us to live out, you will become targeted. You will. You will be persecuted. Even from within the body of Christ, You may be called legalistic. You may be called liberal. You may be called a Marxist. You may be called a Trump supporter. You may be called all kinds of names that are extreme pejorative terms used to shame and disgrace and beat down people within the body of Christ. But brothers and sisters, when you are seeking to live out the kingdom ethics that we have walked through, understand you're not being persecuted if you sinned. If you sinned and God is giving correction, that's not persecution. But living righteously, living as blessed as Jesus has communicated, when people start to insult you, which means, and I've seen this time and time again, you may say something in a moment that somebody may say is contradictory to what you said 19 months ago on Twitter. And they refuse to, re- to receive the truth that you're saying in the moment because they don't want to be corrected. They want to look for your inconsistencies. Don't waste time with such individuals that don't want to ration and reason and enter into the tension prayerful together within the body of Christ. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your energy. Give it to the people who are declaring spiritual bankruptcy and mourning. Comfort them. 
Because the reality is, insults are when people magnify your small errors and then they embellish lies about you. And there's so much name calling now within the body of Christ amongst each other. That's exactly what the definite insult is. You can say something like, I was glad to gather with our church, socially distanced, wearing a mask this morning, 25% capacity, and somebody, you liberal Democrat, da, 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 like, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's the insult. That's what's going on. Or if people say, you know what, we should be gathering 100% capacity, multiple services, no mass, lifting up, singing, letting our spit flow on everyone, because that's faith. And people will say, you radical right extreme, right? you see what I'm saying? That's Christians, that, the world has their own dialogue, they ain't worried about us, we're too busy worried about each other. And so what we recognize is that, man, if we're persecuted and all kinds of evil are uttered against us, which is slander with the intent to damage our reputation, take heart. Jesus says, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Rejoice, brothers and sisters. Don't stop kingdom living because you constantly are dealing with insults. Gather together with like-minded believers here in your local church. Pray and press on. As I close, the Beatitudes are a snapshot of God's kingdom life for the citizen of God's kingdom. Entrance into the kingdom of God is only found through Jesus. He is the port of entry into the kingdom of God, and he provides us with all we need to live as previewers of the kingdom. So my final question is, are you blessed? The only way to answer that question is by answering yes in confirmation that you have declared spiritual bankruptcy that you have mourned over your sinfulness, that you seek to comfort those who mourn over their sinfulness, that you have a developing desire for justice, equity, and moral purity, that you share compassion liberally and forgive freely, but also having boundaries to understand the nuances when crimes are committed. You have a heart that is increasingly desiring pure, holy living. You desire to make peace, and you strive to rejoice and press on when persecution comes. Let's pray as we continue to worship. Father, in this moment, we express our gratitude for your word. 2020 was very challenging. And at the beginning of 2021, may we look to embody the kingdom ethics that we have heard about, and may we live blessed in such a way that the world would be convicted based on our lifestyle rhythms to declare spiritual bankruptcy and mourn so that our family here at Christ Community Church can be used to comfort them and embody these truths. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.